Hello, Dragon Ball Infinity. I'm your DBI admin, Eichenbahn, and today we're going to be talking about uh, Mountain of the Frozen Lightning Spear Parts 1 through 3, which is a roleplay series uh, by Leyland and Hypothermus. Uh, I'm just going to be calling him Hypo, so Leyland and Hypo. Uh, and I believe these are pretty new role players to the mud. I could be wrong. Maybe they've had alts in the past, or maybe they've just been normal players in the past, but they, they seem kind of new. Um, and so I wanted to kind of address, uh, I just finished their third, the, the third chapter of their series, and I just wanted to, you know, welcome them to the roleplay channel and give them some of my, my thoughts and critiques, um, which is, uh, you know, we don't always do videos on every every role play that you're going to do uh but you know usually when we find something that we like or we have something that we we want to say about it uh we, we might do a video and post it as response uh to your role play uh in this case i wanted i thought i think that these are two kind of interesting characters and there's definitely some problems <laughs> with these characters uh but it's mostly just the fact that you're you can't communicate um so just to break it down for those that haven't read it, uh, Hypo is an ex, well, Hypo is an Isserian. I'm going to put big quotes around that. I don't think that they're trying to play off as like a, an actual Frieza style uh, Icer. I think that there's some kind of like more primitive, uh, like a, a different evolutionary branch of Icer that lives out in the wastelands beyond the domes. And uh, Hypo meets Leyland, and Leyland is a uh, one-eyed uh, demon, presumably from Eon. It's, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, he, uh, Leyland arrived on Nig Yellow through like a mysterious portal while their clan was kind of getting wiped out. And you know they didn't know where it was leading or where it was going. They stepped through it. They're on this ice, they're in this icy wasteland. And, uh, and so they, they meet up pretty quickly. Uh, but they can't communicate. They have no way to speak to one another. Leyland can speak common, you know, whatever passes for galactic common in the setting. But, um, but Hypo can't. Uh, and so Hypo kind of just has to get by with, like, gestures and things. But there's sort of this, this problem that keeps coming up throughout these is that, it, like, Hypo clearly wants to communicate an idea. Like, this third one especially, there's several moments where Hypo is, like, he's talking about like this plan that he wants to try to communicate to Leyland, but he never even gets a chance. But like somehow he knows what's going on, even though he shouldn't know what's going on. Like for instance, like there's posts on the third chapter again, where they're heading towards this giant ravine to recover this sword that was uh, lost by some Isserian Smith. And on the way there, Hypo is thinking about how they were going to get down the ravine. But if Hypo can't understand any of the languages being spoken here, then Hypo shouldn't have had any reason to be planning anything. They, they don't even know where they're going or what they're doing. Um, and so, they, so these characters are, they're working together and they're doing well, but I do think that the, the issue of them not being able to communicate at all needs to be resolved quickly. Like, I mean, there could be something like a like some kind of universal translator, like a Babel fish, you know, from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or something. There's there's got to be some way to get over this hurdle. I think Hypo is is being is saying that they're like learning new words, you know, like as they're used by Leyland, but it's uh, that's that's rocky at best. That's rocky at best. Um, not that I would be complaining if they wanted to go the kinku route and like they can repeat any word that they've learned before, been told before, but how do you, how do you communicate more complex ideas than, you know, go there, do this. And, and we'll, we'll get into a little bit more of, uh, of the, the characters themselves a bit, but we'll, again, uh, kind of going back to the story itself in the second chapter, they had journeyed towards this, this ancient mountain that Hypo, in his mind, his history believed used to be full of, like, these monsters. Um, he was a little bit, you know, hesitant to go there, but it's really the only, like, feature of the landscape that could be seen by Leyland whenever they arrived at Hypo's cave. 
uh, they go to this mountain and they start going through it. This mountain is full of these like glowing crystals, and then they start finding all these bones, and that's when they meet this this Isarian smith of some kind. And the smith can speak, and so Hypo kind of is taking on the role of the like the quest giver um, by creating this NPC, and then having that NPC sort of sort of give them a task. Which uh, when they first meet him, he basically just says like. Uh, you know, I might have some things for you to do, and if you do them, maybe I'll help you out a little bit. And later on in the third chapter, we find out that this smith has journeyed through the wasteland for quite a while, and that's where they learn about the ravine, and where this smith had apparently lost his sword some time ago. We don't know how long. Uh, the smith is, you know, kind of not giving a lot of information, but it's kind of like sort of trickling little bits of knowledge. Um, so, and to... To what end? To what purpose? I don't know. Uh, but he tells them about the sword, and then they head over in chapter three, in the third chapter of, of the frozen mount, the mountain of the frozen lightning spear. They head over to this ravine, and this is this is where that communication thing starts to really break down, because once they get to the mountain, um, Hypo clearly wants to help with the story. Like Hypo has these plans, has an idea of how they're going to resolve the situation, of how they're going to get down the ravine. But his character can't tell or communicate to that to Leyland. Um, and so he's kind of written himself into a corner. And so Leyland has to solve the situation. And and what I'm kind of... This is like more of like the actual writing going back and forth here. Like this is a problem between the, the characters not being able to communicate to each other, not the writers. And so the story, like, the posts start getting a little weird. Um, where, like, Hypo has a whole post where he's just waiting for Leyland to say what Leyland thinks they should do. And then Leyland just starts doing something. And so Hypo doesn't get a chance to, like, input his idea. And, like, and, and there's, there's some narrative friction in the posts because of that. And so... Leyland solves the situation by kind of indicating that there's some kind of intelligence to the monsters that live down here. And there are these, you know, these there's a couple stones in the in the caverns that they've found that are not covered in snow, meaning that they've been either like recently moved, they're heated or something. And so they push open the stone and reveal like a like a I don't know, like a slide that goes deeper down in the mountain, which the two of them follow and go down. And then they start indicating that maybe maybe there's either other exiles in the wasteland that live here, or that these creatures are a little bit more intelligent than before. Um, but eventually they find what they're looking for. They, they find a pack of... Oh god, I don't even know how to say this monster. Uh, Thilderon. Thilderon? Uh, that's as close as I can get to it. Thilderon. Like an alpha, and then like a lot of little, little smaller Thilderons. And... They did their they did their best to describe these creatures as being like alien alien beasts, you know, like truly alien in a way. Um, but the description of it's a bit uh, a bit hard. They're described as being like reptilian, but they only have front legs, and then I guess their body ends in kind of like a long tail, but they're also covered in fur. So, like, the way I'm imagining it is, like, kind of like the lower underbody is, like, lizard style, and then they've got, like, main, like manes of, of white fur that go back down all the way through their tails. But the fact that they don't have back legs is, like, weird. Because they're also described as being, like, wolves. It's, so, I don't know. Um, but I did I did enjoy that it wasn't just some random, like, a, like, I don't know, like a bear or wool, or just wolves or even, like, tundra cats or something. That's something that always... I always feel bad about in game for Dragon Ball Infinity is that there's you know there's planets like Hydia and you go there and there's just like vultures and wolves and stuff and bears like like the entire galaxy is populated by all the same animal species somehow or like on Yardrat there's yaks like uh, so so I did like that little point and then we have a a fight um, and Leyland. I gave Leyland a few more, like one more red point, because Leyland acted as sort of the uh, the enemies in that fight. So they, they spent their time like posting the reactions of the Alpha to Hypo. And what I would have really liked to have seen is Hypo to do the, do the bad guys for Leyland, and Leyland to do the bad guys for Hypo, so that both of you were putting in the same amount of effort in your posts. 
uh, to get this story completed. But they, they have this combat, and it's it's pretty good. It's done pretty well. Um, you know, like, Leyland ends up fighting some of the smaller, like, little Theladins, and then uh, Hypo fights the Alpha by himself. And, you know, each one kind of has, it comes with its own, like, different problems. Like, the Alpha is clearly, like, bigger and stronger, can take a lot more. And then the small ones are, like, ganging up and doing, like, pack tactics on Leyland. And so they, they're both, like, pretty seriously threatened in this situation and i think they i think they get both down to like like 20 20 ish rp energy which is you know getting into the you know getting into we're in mortal danger you know level which is good i mean they started at like 40 but still um so it was, it was a good fight they find what they're looking for they find the sword and presumably they're heading back to the smith to give him the sword and hopefully get some kind of reward for their efforts um, we'll have to find out how that's going to all play out. But I'd, I'd say overall these have been good logs. Uh, the biggest complaint I have about it is just that your characters not being able to communicate is causing you problems on the page. It, it's not that it's a bad idea. It's a great idea that they like one person wouldn't be able to communicate with the other. But uh, there's clearly some, some friction going on because of that within the writing itself. And so I think... That could be resolved, as again, as simply as they're probably, there's got to be something like a universal translator, uh, you know, a Babelfish, there's got to be. Uh, it could be something like that, they find like an old technology that allows him to speak, or, you know, even, you know, amongst all his treasures, maybe the, maybe Arct, I forget his name too, how to say it, um, Arcteus, I believe, let me double check, Arcturus. Uh, has like just maybe like some old like Jedi style holocrons with like you know information about the outside world like you know like basically like a like a library that uh, Hypo could to could use to you know quickly start learning some more nuanced concepts, um, but um, overall yeah pretty pretty good. Uh, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying seeing new role players and seeing like a new story kind of ongoing uh, that isn't related to ones that I'm part of. Uh, I'd like to jump in at some point with a character. Maybe I thought about maybe Mjolnir, but uh, we'll we'll see how this progresses. And good job, guys. I'm your DBI admin Ikemon, and this was a role play review.